Good morning, my name is Karen Moeller from Norton Children's Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. I'll be a co-moderator for our core curriculum session on emergency medicine. Our fourth speaker in today's session is Dr. Vimi Lobo, coming to us from University of Michigan, where he's an assistant professor, and he'll be speaking on dental emergencies. Following that, we'll hear from Dr. John Goh about traumatic head and neck emergencies, and he's the director of head and neck imaging at Keck School of Medicine in California. Then Dr. Tanya Roth will speak on non-traumatic head and neck emergencies. She comes to us from Phoenix, Arizona, where she's a senior associate consultant for the Department of Radiology and Otolaryngology at Mayo Clinic. I hope you enjoy your meeting. Welcome to Dentistry in the ER or Dental Emergencies. My name is Remy Lobo. I'm from the University of Michigan. No disclosures, but I do have some things that I wanna say. Special thanks to Dr. Ilona Schmalfus for the opportunity to be here. Dr. Mosier and Nick, two great friends from Indiana University, Ed Quigley and Rick Wiggins from University of Utah, and now where I am, Dr. Serena Vassen, whom I work with at the University of Michigan. They're a part of the ASH and our family. This is really a family. It's the best society there is because of the people. Uh, and of course, the company is also great too. Uh, it's just it's a really great opportunity to be here, and thank you to you all. And special thanks to Dr. Dan Leatherwood from Indiana. He used to remind me while we were staffing cases, don't forget to look at the teeth. And there are two articles I want to draw your attention to. One is from 2012, Teeth, What the Radiologist Should Know. And the other one was last year by L'Oreal uh, Dental Emergencies Practical. These both in radio graphics, both excellent reads, and have given me a lot of information for this talk and just for life in general. So let's look at the scope of the problem. There are 330 residents, 330 million residents in the U.S., over 300 million adults. And you figure each adult has about 32 teeth in the mouth, in each mouth. There are local variations that exist. I know, I will admit to that. There is such a thing as the meth west. You know, not everybody has as many teeth as you would expect them to have. Kids have up to 20 teeth per mouth. They don't have premolars. They don't have third molars, but everything else is accounted for there. I live in Michigan. A lot of kids play hockey. They play hockey year-round, so maybe they don't have all their teeth either. But however you want to do it, there's well over 10 billion teeth in the country. So this is a really important topic, and there's well over 2 million visits to the ER per year. Every night you're working in the ER, you're going to see something that relates to the teeth. So here's my public service announcement. How old do you think this patient is? Turns out she's 23. Methamphetamines are not good for your teeth. So here's my ADA public service announcement from the American Dental Association. This comes from the Mouth Healthy website. I don't know if you can see them. I did air quotes there. Brush your teeth for two minutes, twice daily. Use a soft brush, floss regularly. If you have a damaged tooth, keep it moist. If you can get it back in your mouth, that's a reasonable option as long as you're not disrupting the root. Uh, and if you have like milk, if you're doing that, you can also put it in a cup of milk on, when you're on your way to the dentist. This is advice for life. Use a mouth guard if you're playing sports or if your kids are playing sports. Don't chew ice, hard candy, or kernels. Honestly, you probably should avoid candy just in general. And remember, even though they're really, really convenient, your teeth are not scissors. So let's figure out how to name the teeth. Uh, and incidentally, this image comes from uh, Head, Neck, Brain, Spine. This is Brett Young's website. I think he made this website while he was a resident or a fellow at Duke. It's an amazing site. It's done so much for trainees the world over, as well as faculty uh, and fellows. Just it's, it's just a great site. I think everybody should be on it regularly. And if they took donations, I would give them donations too. <laughs> anyway, so how do we find the names of the different teeth? Well, let's start in the middle. In the middle, we have incisors. You have central, they're in green, and orange, lateral. So you have central incisors and lateral incisors with the maxilla and the mandible. As you work out, shown in pink here, there are the canines. As you keep working out, you get to the premolars. There are first and second premolars as you move medial to lateral, light blue to yellow. And then we have the molars, one, two, three, first, second, third, as we go medial to lateral. Some people go by counting. They like putting the numbers in their reports. So for counting, the right third maxillary molar is tooth number one. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and imagine Snape down in the dungeon has class and Hermione's there and he asks a question and immediately Hermione's hand goes up in the air. Hermione's right hand goes shooting up in the air because she's always got the number one 
answer. She's always right. That's Hermione. That's how I remember the right third maxillary molar is my, my Hermione tooth. The right tooth is number one. Right maxillary molar is number one. The other way, I don't know if you remember this, about eight years ago, we were at ASHNR in Miami, and I remember being told to put my finger on my chin, right at the mental prominence there, and think to the left is Christmas Eve, to the right is Christmas Day. The left central mandibular incisor is 24, the right central mandibular incisor is tooth number 25. So I'll give you a little quiz, which tooth is missing? It's a mandibular molar. This is the second mandibular molar. Which teeth were pulled out? Well, these are the, also the third mandibular molars that were pulled here. It's the maxillary and the mandibular molars were pulled. That's 16 and 17. So looking at the tooth more closely, when we're above this mental enamel junction, we're looking at the crown. The densest bone you're going to see in the body is this enamel. That's the surface covering the tooth. Deep to that, you're going to see the dentin. The dentin is kind of that more grayish structure. In the center, you have the pulp. A pulp cavity extends along the deep margin of the tooth as part of the root canal. And keep in mind, there's also a space on the outer aspect of the tooth called the periodontal space. Everything below that cemento enamel junction is considered the root. One other thing I want you to be aware of when you're looking at the mandible is think about the myelohyoid ridge. That's an insertion along the inner border of the mandible where the myelohyoid inserts. And the reason it matters has to do with the positioning of the tooth roots. The first mandibular molar and all the tooth medial have insertions above that myelohyoid ridge, but the second and third mandibular molar project below the myelohyoid ridge. All right, so we're gonna go through cases. We'll do trauma infection as well as some other case. Uh, so we'll start with trauma. 36 year old male comes with trauma. We had algorithm. You can see a colonnaded displaced fracture through the right mandibular body, it's obliquely oriented here on the coronal. We have a nice empty tooth socket with this tooth that's kind of falling out into space. It's pretty deep caries, that tooth. Uh, Dr. Moshe used to tell me we call that carious amputation. It's a phrase that I really liked using in my dictations. When we see fractures, it's very easy to describe the fracture, but sometimes it's hard to see the second abnormality. And that sagittal actually had a second abnormality with the right maxillary premolar. You can see that periapical widening, that periodontal space is a little bit too wide. So let's talk about dental trauma. We have different types of trauma. We think of fracture, luxation, and avulsion. The fracture is kind of very, very common. The crown is most commonly broken, and the clinicians know this. They look in the mouth, and there's a tooth that's cracked right in front of them. If it goes to imaging, which doesn't always happen, uh, we should report the affected segment. Is it involving the crown? Is it involving the root? Or a combination of both? Luxation is very common in the pediatric population. The maxillary incisors are classically affected given their central and anterior prominence. And if you have an empty tooth socket like we did here, you're thinking of an avulsion. It's kind of an empty socket where the tooth just kind of pops right out. So these are flavors of luxation, if you will. The first kind of minor injury is a concussion. So you can have a tooth concussion. Yes, that is a thing. It's just when your tooth is a little bit tender, but it's not loose. You can have... Uh, subluxation of the tooth. It's a little bit loose. It's kind of tender. Neither one of these have any kind of imaging abnormality. The first time we see something on imaging is when we get to an extrusive luxation as shown here. In an extrusive luxation, you have widening of the periodontal ligament space. And the lateral luxation, you have that widened space often associated with a fracture of the bone. An interest of luxation is a little bit different. It actually has decrease of the periodontal ligament space because the tooth gets impacted. Imagine the tooth getting jammed into the alveolar ridge. <coughs> Dental traumas are repaired. They're repaired through operative fixation. Avulsed or damaged teeth are removed as they were in this case, and they can put a plate and screws and kind of reapproximate. Another 35-year-old male with trauma. Axial and coronal bone algorithm. This actually was one month prior. So I said he had trauma, but he actually didn't have trauma. He came because of a different reason. I'll show that in a moment. This guy was walking around with a broken mandible. You can actually see the callus formation on this inferior border on the coronal. So right at that mental prominence, he's actually already building kind of an obliquely oriented fracture as it runs up between uh, the left 
central mandibular incisor, that's the number 24, and tooth number 23, and it kind of loops around behind 24 as well. We go a little bit more posteriorly and more superiorly, we can see an additional fracture through the mandible. You can see the offset here, and you can actually see the callus formation. This patient has a few dental caries. You can see this pretty deep uh, caries here bilaterally. He also has a periapical lucency associated with that left third mandibular molar. We're going to come back to that in a moment. So I told you he had trauma a month ago. He never sought any medical care for it. He thought he was fine, so he was kind of going about his business. He did come to the ER, however, one month later because of facial swelling. So this guy had trauma, dental trauma specifically, but he showed up because of a late complication. So because his teeth were not repaired, he developed a transpatial infection. So here you can see this ring-enhancing collection in the masticator space, kind of working its way along the left neck and then kind of obliquely along the left neck here. It gets down to about the level of the larynx. There's edema of the airway or pharynx is displaced medially, and even the myelohyoid here is displaced medially. So when patients have trauma, dental trauma or other, they really should have prompt medical evaluation. These aren't things we want to just let sit idle, as happened in this case. Late complications are often related to the oral flora. If patients get infected, it's really hard to treat them because there are so many different agents they have to target. So you have to actually give them multiple agents or at least multiple covering agents to account for that. These patients need surgery, IND, washouts when it comes to these late complications. And I'm reminded of a quote Okay, so we went from trauma to infection. Let's look at a little more infection. 26-year-old female with right facial swelling. We have an axon coronal bone algorithm. Put it in the soft tissue and see if you can find the abnormality. Go back to that bone algorithm. You can see that kind of lucency here along the right lateral border of the maxilla. You can see a periapical lucency that's kind of well circumscribed here on the coronal. And this is with the central, lateral, canine, first, second. That's at the second right maxillary premolar. There's your ring-enhancing collection in the adjacent soft tissues on the gingival buccal sulcus. It's an abscess. And the reason she came in, remember, was facial swelling. In yellow, you can see that right facial swelling. So this is a case of an odontogenic abscess. It's a ring-enhancing collection along the right gingival buccal sulcus. It's affiliated with a tooth root. In this case, it was a maxillary premolar. It's often accompanied by an overlying cellulitis as outlined here in yellow. Compared to the contralateral side with normal fat, here's all that edematous and wet fat. These patients are taken care of in the ER. You can do an incision and drainage. They can stick a needle in there, numb it up, and just aspirate or cut out and get that pus out. And again, they're sent home on antibiotics to help get rid of the infection. Another companion case, different odontogenic abscess. Kind of same idea. Once you see one of these, you, you kind of seen them all. They all kind of look really similar. So here we have a canine that has a lucency associated with the tooth root. You can see disruption of the adjacent cortex, a nice ring enhancing collection that's circled here and extensive overlying reticulation of the soft tissue. Notice anterior to the right maxillary sinus, the fat is kind of, it's pretty quiet, but anterior to the left maxillary sinus in this canine, the fat is quite upset. It's very edematous. So, of course, we're going to report the abscess. We'll comment on that. They probably know it's already there, but the patient went to CT imaging. Why did they do that? Well, they're looking for extensive infection. Seen here on the, the edema working its way up towards the left orbit. So that's what we're really looking for when these patients come to us. We're looking to see where the infection goes. Is there a post-septal extension shown here in green? Is there odontogenic sinusitis shown here in blue? Another 34-year-old male shows up with neck swelling. Here we have a lucency along the inner border of that right mandible. See what the bones look like there. Kind of working a lot, a lot of edema here, working its way anteriorly and medially. This is that lucency along the inner border of the mandible outlined in red. And you can see this kind of L-shaped tracking collection from the medial border of the mandible to the sublingual space. There is an abnormality on that bone algorithm. It's kind of hard to see. I'll zoom it up. It's pretty subtle. There is a tiny, tiny, tiny lucency associated with that right third mandibular molar tooth root. And here in blue, you can see all that inflammatory signal working its way immediately. So this is a case 
uh, where even though the patient had multiple dental caries, you see how one small tooth abnormality can cause a very, very big problem. In this case, we look at the myelohyde. You see that myelohyde outlined here in red, and it's displaced medially. That kind of points to the second or third mandibular molar being the tooth abnormality of origin. In this case, it was the third right mandibular molar that they ended up pulling when they went to the OR. This patient had a pretty extensive infection. So what happened here was a floor of mouth abscess. And how did it get there? Well, there was an abnormality at that right third mandibular molar. It developed an abscess into the adjacent soft tissues in the submandibular space. From there, it worked its way medially through a defect into the sublingual space that's kind of shown here in red. The submandibular space also has communication close to the parapharyngeal space, kind of shown here in blue. You can see the edema in the airway as well. Once you get to the parapharyngeal space, you can work your way craniocaudal, most commonly caudal, and you can work your way down to the mediastinum, as shown here in yellow. So this patient had a pretty extensive abnormality, a floor mouth abscess, but extensive edema along the anterior neck, working its way toward the mediastinum. That sometimes people call that Ludwig angina. I feel like to name stuff after dead people. These patients need surgery. Uh, actually, the most important thing they need is someone to secure their airway. So either ENT or anesthesia has to get a tube in that throat and make sure they don't lose the airway. They go to the OR, they get bilateral neck exploration and drainage. And remember, all of this was from a tiny, tiny tooth that caused the abnormality. You can see these bilateral Penrose drains that were needed to drain the floor mouth abscess. Okay, we went through some trauma, we went through some infection. Let's see another case, kind of a, <clears throat> a post-operative complication. So this is a 68-year-old woman who had recent tooth extraction. She actually had a mandibular resurfacing procedure. You can see how nice that cortex looks now after the surgery, but she came back to the ER because of some facial swelling. You can see this intermediate kind of low attenuating signal on the inner border of the mandible. You can see that the myelohyde is displaced medially as well. And you can even look in that bone, look in the mandible, you can see the diploic space on the right. You can see fat. Fat's great. Fat's my friend. You look at that left hemi mandible and it's all too wet. There's too much soft tissue density inside there, so that bone's way too wet. So the medial position of the myelohyde in this case helped point to the source of origin. Even though there were no teeth that were abnormal in this case, it was the site of surgery along the second and third mandibular molar teeth that were actually removed. Uh, there was an inflammatory process that started, an infection in this case that helped elevate the myelohyde, push it medially, and it kind of pointed the docs to the source abnormality. So this collection ended up being in the submandibular space when they took it out. Uh, and even though we didn't have teeth to pull, it suggests that the second and third mandibular molars were really the teeth that they were targeting. So the take-home points I have for you, remember there are 32 teeth in the adult mouth, 20 teeth in the child mouth. We call the adult teeth permanent. We call the child teeth primary. Trauma is common. So for you, the take-home message is see if you can report the portion of the tooth that's involved. Is it the crown, the root, or is it a combination of the two? Use that myelohyde as a marker for the submandibular and sublingual space. And also keep in mind that it can help point you to the tooth of origin. Maybe it's coming from the second or third mandibular molar. It's kind of infralateral to the myelohyde. And with anything, prevention is the key. Brush, floss, and protect your chompers. Thank you very much for letting me speak with you today. I hope to see you next year in person in San Diego. Hi. This is John Goh from the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, California. My topic today is uh, traumatic head and neck emergencies. I have no disclosures. First, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Alona Schmalfus and the organizing committee for inviting me to speak today. Um, she's, she has put together a phenomenal meeting and even though this is a virtual meeting, I really am sad that uh, we can't all meet in person this year, but we will next year. I'd also like to thank uh, two of my colleagues at USC, uh, Jay Acharya and Anand Rajamahan, for helping me put together this talk today. So we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be talking about traumatic head and neck emergencies with a, a twist, the twist being in a setting um, that requires endovascular or surgical treatment. Um, so we'll have a brief introduction, um, and we'll talk about clinical assessment and some imaging techniques. 
Um, talk about uh, cervical vascular injury, laryngotracheal injury, and pharyngoesophageal injury. Temporal bone and skull based injuries were already covered by uh, Dr. Strauss earlier. So the first thing you should do is you really need to review the EMR. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've received uh, requests uh, for, the, for CT or CTAs uh, in which the, the, basically the whole history is trauma. And you really didn't need to know to, what type of trauma are you dealing with. Is this non-penetrating trauma uh, resulting from a direct blow, whether it's an anterior blow that results in fracture of the osteocarlatial structures or injury to the laryngeal soft tissues or pharynx. Um, cervical vascular injury, either direct arterial injury or venous injury, or hematoma uh, resulting in airway impingement, or by indirect mechanisms such as a fracture of the cervical spine leading to cervical vascular injury. Or is it penetrating trauma? Because 1% of admissions um, is a penetrating trauma. As we know, if penetrating trauma doesn't respect the normal fat planes and necessitates evaluating ostriches along its path. In the setting of high velocity projectiles, such as bullets, the site of injury may be remote due to the resultant shock wave. Our um, surgical colleagues divide the neck into zonal anatomy when it comes to trauma. Three zones zone one from the sternal notch to the cricoid cartilage. Zone two, from the cricoid cartilage to the angle of the mandible. And zone three injuries, from the angle of the mandible to the skull base. Um, as head and neck radiologist, and from the talks that you're going to be getting from our speakers, we can divide the neck, of course, uh, utilizing um, uh, cervical fascia, both the superficial and deep cervical fascia. The superficial cervical fascia is a connective tissue layer the lies between the dermis and the deep layer of deep cervical fascia and contains platysma, subcutaneous blood vessels and fat, while the deep cervical fascia subdivides the neck into compartments, uh, as we all know, and that's where all the vital structures actually are. Here's a diagram of the zonal anatomy that's uh, quite often used by our surgical colleagues, zone one, uh, going from um, inferior to superior, zone one, two, and three, as well as in this image, showing you examples of both the superficial and the deep cervical fascia. Red is the superficial cervical fascia, which is an investing fascia that really surrounds the neck, but it's really the three layers of deep cervical fascia that subdivide and compartmentalize the neck. We can also divide the neck also into a central and lateral neck. The central neck is where the major vital structures, such as the larynx, uh, pharynx, uh, lie, and the lateral neck where the um, major vessels are situated for the potential for vascular injury. So as part of the clinical assessment, where is the injury to the neck? Is it the central? Is it a central injury in which uh, you can have laryngotracheal or pharyngoesophageal injury or lateral injury to the neck that can result in cervical vascular injury? There are different means by which you can image the neck. Um, plain film radiography has been used in the past. We can see subcutaneous emphysema, foreign body, airway impingement or displacement or soft tissue swelling. But this really has been supplanted by CT and CT angiography. Uh, we can actually see hematomas, the presence of subcutaneous emphysema, and air within the deep spaces or presence of foreign body. CT angiography is used for the depiction of cervical vascular injury. MRI in the emergency room setting can also be used to look for cervical vascular injury, hematoma, or infarcts. Uh, and uh, diagnostic angiography in this setting um, in a setting of diagnosis and emergency treatment. There are a number of um, different criteria that are used to decide whether or not a, a non-contrast CT or a CT angiogram should be performed. Um, um, the modified Denver criteria and the Memphis criteria are two criteria. Uh, you can see risk factors and signs and symptoms uh, here um, that um, if you have any of these symptoms, uh, CT angiography of the head and neck should be performed. Um, uh, due to time constraints, um, I'll let you peruse this later as you review this talk. Um, with CT, try to use um, all the modalities available to you on CT, not just the, uh, the images themselves, but you can also use multiplanar reformats, MIP images. Surface rendering is great, uh, especially in patients who have sustained penetrating trauma and you're trying to determine where the entry and exit wounds are. Uh, here in this patient uh, who sustained a stab wound to the neck, there is a skin abnormality on the right, but sometimes the um, entry wound can be very small and you don't even know where it is. 
But if you do a surface render display of the neck, for example, you can see, for example, where the entry wound was in this patient on the right side compared to the left. Cervical vascular injury may result in minor injury. And 0.86 to 1.03% of patients have neurologic symptoms from neck injury. But interestingly enough, 53 to 79% of patients are asymptomatic at the time of injury. What are signs of vascular injury? Rapidly expanding hematoma, new onset of Horner syndrome, a new neurological deficit or cranial neuropathy, loss of motor or sensory function, blunt trauma or ecchymosis at the site of injury. In patients who sustain penetrating trauma, all patients should get a CT angiogram to examine the path of the offending object uh, and look, looking, looking for vascular injury. So uh, I'd like to provide you with a checklist of how I personally evaluate patients with, uh, who I suspect may have cervical vascular injury. I start from below at the level of the aortic arch and great vessels. And as you follow the vessels superiorly into the neck, um, you should see a fat plane which totally encircles the vessel as you go superiorly. Vessels are smooth and round. They narrow as you go from proximal to distal. So any abrupt change in caliber or contour of the vessel should uh, immediately alert you that there may be a vascular injury. Always remember to inspect the external carotid artery. Uh, you, may see, you may find extravasation, pseudoaneurysm formation, or vascular occlusion, though in a setting of vascular occlusion for the external carotid uh, in its branches, this really does not necessitate treatment due to rich collaterals. Here's a patient who sustained a stab wound to the left neck. Um, here you see periods being a collection of contrast, um, separated from the internal carotid artery. This is a hematoma. This is actually a pseudoaneurysm left internal maxillary artery. You can see it on the coronal images. And then on this angiogram of the external carotid artery, uh, pre embolization, you can see um, the proximal part of the IMAX, this multilobar extravasation of contrast here, uh, and then marked narrowing, which is a dissection of the uh, internal maxillary artery, and here you see coil embolization of that pseudoaneurysm. So with cervical vascular injury, you may see hematoma formation, luminal narrowing, uh, you may see a dissection flap um, in the same vascular dissection, or the vessel itself may taper abruptly due to thrombosis of the false lumen. Pseudoaneurysm formation can happen. This is due to rupture of the vessel, but it's contained by the adventitia of the vessel. Uh, you may see frank extravasation contrast, um, and it can be contained by a surrounding hematoma. Uh, with the setting of, uh, in the setting of projectiles, uh, the kinetic energy that's released into the soft tissues by the projectile can result in vascular injury away from the projectile due to the shock wave. Uh, patients who sustain venous injury may result in hematoma formation, but this is not life-threatening. There are different types of classification schemes. The two major ones are the Biffle classification and the Denver classification. The most common is the Biffle classification, grades 1 through 5. Grade 1 is an intimal injury with a regular intima uh, with less than 25% narrowing of the vessel. Grade 2 is a dissection with an intimal flap causing greater than 25% luminal narrowing or intraluminal thrombus. Grade 3 uh, is pseudoaneurysm formation. Grade 4 is uh, vessel occlusion or thrombosis. And grade 5 is transection of the vessels. The significance of the Biffle classification is that the higher the grade, the worse the prognosis and the risk of stroke. Patients with a grade 1 injury, these typically heal over time. Grade 2 injuries are treated with heparin and potential stenting. Grade 3 injuries are treated with stenting of the parent vessel. Uh, grade 4 um, Actually, grade five injuries are lethal if untreated and require surgical repair. Here's an example of a patient who had a uh, stab wound uh, to the neck. Um, uh, it wasn't realized the patient um, actually had a pseudoaneurysm. This is a thrombose pseudoaneurysm with uh, uh, wall calcification. You can see it rising from the internal carotid artery here in both the axial and coronal images. Sagittal images, excuse me. Here's an example of a vertebral artery transection. Um, this would be a biffle grade 5. Here you see in the um, early to mid arterial phase of this aortogram, there's attenuation of the vertebral artery. And we see uh, as we go through the angiogram, there's extravasation of contrast and no distal flow. This is a transection of the vertebral artery uh, that was embolized. Laryngotracheal injury occurs in 1 to 7% of penetrating trauma to the neck. Um, there's a 
uh, indirect or direct blows uh, to the larynx. Indirect blow can result in uh, compression due to a hematoma formation. Uh, you can have an intramural hematoma that causes luminal narrowing of the larynx. Direct flow blow can result in fracture of the hyoid bone or cartilaginous structures. Here's a picture of just the osteocartilaginous structures of the larynx. You'll get uh, lectures on this later when in the larynx uh, session. Here's the hyoid bone, the epiglottis. Uh, thyroid cards, cricoid, and retinoids. Notice that the retinoids sit along the superior aspect of the posterior arch of the cricoid and are directed superiorly. So patients can um, get uh, laryngeal hematomas related to blunt trauma. Here's a patient. Um, uh, you can see a hematoma at the level of the uh, supraglottis on the left side. Uh, you can see there's mineralization of the supraglottis with mild luminal narrowing uh, extending to the posterior wall of the larynx. Uh, it's a different patient. There was a fracture of the um, inferior cornea of the thyroid cartilage on the right that, uh, with secondary hematoma. Uh, you can see that this in the region of the subglottis, there's mild narrowing of the subglottis here. The patient had um, difficulty breathing. Uh, there's also extra laryngeal hematoma with slight loud displacement of the thyroid cartilage. Um, highway Bone fractures as an isolated event are extremely rare. Uh, I think like maybe 0.02% of cases. Uh, this is actually from literature of a patient with a non comminuted fracture of the hyoid bone on the left side uh, without hematoma formation. Um, injury to the epiglottis um, can uh, result, uh, the, the epiglottis itself is spoon shaped and is held in place by the pedial and the hyoepiglottic ligament. Uh, you can get mucosal tears, rupture of the hyoepiglottic limb, or cartilaginous fractures. Fracture of the thyroid cartilage uh, can be difficult to see because ossification typically occurs in the second decade of life. Uh, vertical fractures are the most common pattern. Um, you can have fractures of the mean aspect of the thyroid cartilage through the midline. Uh, you can also have fractures of the greater and lesser cornea. Here's an example of a comminuted fracture of the uh, thyroid ala on the right side. Uh, you can see it uh, across this midline with a non common fracture on the, on the left. Here's a 3D shaded display of the thyroid, both right and left side. Here you can see the vertical fracture of the thyroid cartilage, also the fracture in, um, in the left paramean location. Um, injury at the cricoarytenoid joint typically is going to be subluxation or dislocation of the cricoarytenoid at the level of the cricoretinoid joint. This, this is a, the most common injury to the retinoid cartilage is subluxation. This is best seen on sagittal images with anterior tilt of the retinoid cartilage. On axial images, um, you will have loss of isomerism of the bilateral cricoretinoid joint. Uh, these are symmetrical joints. They move in unison uh, and symmetrically. So if, if the uh, cricoretinoid joint appears to be asymmetric, you may be dealing with retinoid subluxation or dislocation. This, the affected site is going to cause asymmetric appearance of the true vocal fold, and this, is this will cause laxity of the air epiglottic fold. Here's an example of a patient who sustained a blow to the larynx and had dysphonia. Notice that um, here's the cricoretinoid joint, both right and left side. This is the top of the cricoid. This is loss of isomerism or some uh, symmetry of the cricoretinoid joint. There's mesolization of the true vocal fold on the left, as well as the AE fold. This used to be a hard diagnosis to make, but it's much easier on axial images, but much easier now to see on sagittal images. Here's both the right parasagittal and left parasagittal image. This is the normal retinoid on the right, and it's oriented superiorly from the posterior arch of the cricoid at the cricoretinoid joint. Notice on the left side, anterior displacement and slight anterior tilt of the retinoid on the left. This is an example of a retinoid subluxation on the left side. Cricoid injury. The cricoid cartilage is the only complete ring in the laryngeal tracheal tree. Fractures of the cricoid typically occur in more than one place. Um, the lumen could uh, may collapse due to the fracture and any um, mucosal thickening in the uh, uh, subglottic region is considered abnormal. Here's an example of a non common fracture of the, um, of the cricoid ring on the right side. Um, you can see that there is actually a subglottic hematoma causing mild narrowing. Laryngeal tracheal separation is the worst type of injury, um, though you can have perforations of the larynx with extensive subcutaneous emphysema. With laryngeal tracheal separation, you have injury of the cricothyroid membrane, which may be partial or complete. 
Uh, you can uh, have a signature mouse subcutaneous emphysema around the larynx and visceral space. Um, ringotracheal separation is considered, is usually fatal unless an airway is established at the time of injury. Uh, and this usually does not occur as an isolated event. You may have associated cartilaginous injury or cryotic injury. Uh, you may have indis inferior displacement of the trachea at the site of complete tear or superior migration of the highway bone relative to the lower margin of the mandible. There is a classification scheme for laryngeal tracheal injury. Uh, it's the schaefer Furman classification, groups of from 0 to 5. It actually gets worse. Again, uh, due to time constraints, uh, you guys can review this uh, later. Uh, I'll just give you an example of, of laryngeal tears. Uh, here's an example of a patient um, who uh, had a, a blow to the larynx. Uh, significant amount of subcutaneous emphysema in the visceral space. Lots of air around the larynx here. And on the AP view, this is an anterior view. The tear was found to be in a right anterior location, but this anterior extension of air directly in communication with the larynx. This is an example of uh, a laryngeal tear. Uh, here's a different patient. Um, laryngeal injury, which was related to a thyroid cartilage fracture on the left side, but you can see the significant amount of subcutaneous emphysema uh, extending up into the uh, upper neck on the left, um, and this was due to the thyroid cartilage fracture. Pharyngoesophageal injury is due to penetrating trauma. It occurs in up to 0.9 to 6.6% of cases. Like laryngeal tracheal injury, you may see pharyngoesophageal, you may see subcutaneous emphysema within the deep spaces of the neck. And so you want to determine the trajectory to determine the site of injury. You can have mural or extrinsic hematomas. Um, and if you suspect pharyngoesophageal injury, this should uh, trigger a swallowing study um, if endoscopy not performed. Uh, in the same endoscopy, sensitivity is between 50 and 60% with specificity of 100%. However, not all perforations will demonstrate subcutaneous emphysema. Here's a patient with a hypopharyngeal perforation. You can see at the level of the aeroboglotic fold in piriform sinus, very extensive wall thickening. There's a hematoma in the AE fold with subcutaneous emphysema. This patient did get a swallowing study, and the patient had a hypopharyngeal perforation uh, at the level of the piriform sinus on the left side. Uh, here's a different patient, had a low pharyngeal injury. Um, this patient was taken to surgery. This is a drain. However, you can see extensive edema in the oral pharyngeal wall on the right side, and this is packing in the oral pharynx. Uh, and, there's a, and this air actually represents um, the perforation. And this shows you just the amount of edema associated with the oral pharyngeal wall uh, laterally and uh, medial to the mandible. So in conclusion, we reviewed different types of traumatic head and neck injuries which you may encounter, which would require endovascular or surgical treatment. You should uh, try to determine the type of injury the patient sustained, the mechanism of the injury, and the setting of penetrating trauma, ascertain the path of injury within the neck, and be wary of remote injury, especially in the setting of ballistic injury to the neck. Again, I'd like to thank the organizers um, for giving this talk. Have a nice meeting. I'd like to thank Alona for the invitation to speak today on non-traumatic head and neck emergencies. So in the next 20 minutes, we'll review the appropriate imaging evaluation of patients presenting with acute head and neck symptoms and do a case-based review of the imaging features and complications of common head and neck emergencies. Patients presenting to the ER with head and neck complaints present with symptoms including facial pain and headaches, orbital swelling, neck pain and swelling, odynophagia, dysphagia, otalgia, and hemoptysis. Overwhelmingly, the majority of their symptoms are related to infectious or inflammatory processes with a minority related to tumor. CT, consequently, is the best first-line study of choice in assessing these patients usually. It's helpful to fully characterize the full extent of infectious and inflammatory processes, which oftentimes extend to the intracranial compartment, the orbit, and the adjacent thorax. It's useful to characterize drainable fluid collections and characterize vascular complications. So with that in mind, let's do a case-based review. We'll start out with patients complaining of otalgia. So this was an eight-year-old boy with otalgia and fever. And here we can see there's opacification of the right middle ear cavity and mastoid air cells. Uh, 
in the clinical history, it's consistent with otomastoiditis, which typically doesn't require imaging unless the patient is toxic, as this child was. And here we can see there's an adjacent mature rim-enhancing right temporal lobe abscess with surrounding vasogenic edema. It has a characteristic appearance on MR with restricted diffusion and a thick rind of peripheral enhancement with associated early dilatation of the adjacent right temporal horn. This is the companion case also of a child with right-sided otomastoiditis, but note in this case that there's bony erosive changes making this characteristic of coalescent otomastoiditis. In the adjacent brain, we see again a large soft tissue brain abscess involving the right cerebellar hemisphere causing mass effect on the fourth ventricle with hydrocephalus and dilatation of the temporal horns. On MRI, it has a characteristic appearance again of abscess with restricted diffusion and a thick rind of peripheral enhancement. It's localized acidosis that results in osteoclastic resorption leading to coalescent otomastoiditis. In this patient with coalescent otomastoiditis, we see erosive changes of the mastoid septi and of the sigmoid plate. When we look intracranially, we can see that there's an adjacent epidural abscess displacing the adjacent sigmoid sinus and that there's also a large adjacent subperiosteal abscess superficial to the temporal bone. The coronal image nicely characterizes the epidural abscess, elevating the adjacent sigmoid sinus, which is thrombosed when we compare it to the normally enhancing right side. In this patient with otalgia and a history of diabetes, note that the right middle ear cavity is well aerated, but we see abnormal soft tissue thickening along the external auditory canal with an area of ulceration also seen within the cartilaginous portion of the EAC and extending to erode the underlying uh, bony portion as well as the mastoid. And these classic bony erosive changes in the setting of this clinical history is characteristic of malignant otitis externa commonly occurring in diabetic or immunosuppressed patients with a differential including cholesteatoma and squamous cell cancer and the clinical hips history helping to differentiate these. Moving on to patients with facial pain, here we have a patient presenting with right sided facial pain and we see a large subperiosteal abscess surrounding the right maxilla. Dr. Lobo covered dental infections, but it's just important to remind you that a lot of times patients with facial cellulitis have a dental etiology. Here we can see a subtle periapical abscess of the right maxillary central incisor that's the cause and these are often best seen in the sagittal images on CT. In this patient with uh, scalp soft tissue swelling and pain, we can see right frontal scalp soft tissue swelling with a pacification of the right frontal sinus. When we look closely, there's a small fistulous tract from the sinus to the scalp. On MRI, we can see a mature fluid collection with restricted diffusion and rim enhancement and the right frontal scalp abutting the calvarium with the small fistulous tract again seen. And this is a classic case of POTS puffy tumor or subperiosteal abscess from chronic frontal sinusitis common in teens or most commonly seen in teens. This is a companion case of a patient with right frontal sinusitis and overlying scalp soft tissue thickening, but this patient also had symptoms of right eye swelling and headache, and here we can see an adjacent right frontal epidural abscess as well as a large uh, abscess in the superior right orbit extending retrobulbar with uh, right-sided proptosis and hypoglobus. The MRI nicely characterizes associated pachymeningeal enhancement indicating a component of meningitis in addition to the epidural abscess and the intraorbital abscess. So paranasal sinus disease uh, can result in orbital abscesses and intracranial infection. And this patient with a history of facial pain and congestion and a history of transplant, note that there's left maxillary sinus opacification. It's always important to clearly look at the uh, surrounding soft tissue planes carefully. And here we can see stranding in the left retroantral fat compared to the right side. And this feature should make you worry about invasive fungal sinusitis. On the MRI, we confirm fungal elements that are T2 intermediate and the left maxillary sinus, as well as necrosis of the turbinate, which lacks enhancement compared to the normal right side and marked phlegmon in the left masticator space. So a nice case of invasive fungal sinusitis. There's also perineural enhancement along left V3, which you can see with invasive fungal disease. This is a companion case of invasive fungal sinusitis involving the sphenoid and a patient with a history of rheumatoid and vision changes. When we look closely at the superior orbital fissure, we can see the fat demonstrates stranding compared to the normal left side. We can see contents from the sphenoid extending adjacent to the clinoid right ICA. 
On MRI, we can see enhancement in the right superior orbital fissure, including enhancement of the wall, the right clinoid ICA, and this patient with invasive fungal disease. Unfortunately, the carotid occluded with reconstitution of the supraclinoid via collaterals, and the patient suffered from border zone infarcts. So remember, invasive fungal sinusitis occurs in immunocompromised patients, can result in areas of soft tissue infiltration and loss of contrast enhancement, as we see in the turbinates here and can extend to the intracranial and intraorbital compartments. And this patient with facial pain and swelling, we see hyperenhancement of the right protoglam with thickening of the distal right stensense duct without a discrete calculus, and note thickening of the right platysma muscle with surrounding uh, adjacent stranding. The platysma muscle is always thickened in patients with parotitis, even when it's subtle. This is a case of classic acute acalculus parotitis. In this companion case, we have a 91-year-old patient with, again, features of right parotitis, but in this case, there's frank abscess formation within the right protogland with a large calculus obstructing the distal right stents and stuck nicely seen on the bone windows and also seen here on a coronal. This was able to be delivered via a transoral incision after which a large amount of pus was expressed from the right stents and stucked. Moving on to patients with neck swelling, uh, here we have a 23-year-old patient with a history of IV drug abuse who presented with left neck swelling and we see abnormal soft tissue uh, emphysema in the left masticator space with marked stranding of the soft tissue planes in areas of untreated dental caries. On these coronal reformats, we can see numerous bilateral rim-enhancing neck abscesses with thickening of the deep and superficial soft tissue planes in this patient with necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, oftentimes polymicrobial due to an odontogenic source, typically in immunocompromised patients. And this 27-year-old presenting with left-sided neck pain and swelling, we can see central low attenuation and enlarged left level 2 lymph nodes. When we evaluate the soft tissue planes carefully, we can see areas of stranding of the fat planes indicating this is an infectious or inflammatory process, and this represents separative lymphadenitis in this patient with a history of chronic granulomatous disease. And this companion case of a 28-year-old presenting with right-sided neck swelling, we again see abnormal level 2 lymph nodes, uh, in this case partially matted in appearance and with areas of central low attenuation, but with a lack of surrounding inflammatory changes. And this was a case of tuberculous lymphadenitis, uh, which can be characterized by central caseation. You may see matting of lymph nodes, and oftentimes it lacks substantial inflammatory changes. Uh, there's no way to distinguish this from malignancy, and it requires soft tissue sampling, as was performed in this case. And this patient uh, who presented with neck uh, swelling, they required emergent intubation to secure their airway in the ER. Here we can see marked thickening of the submandibular soft tissues. CT confirms phlegmon within the anterior floor mouth with abscess formation extending into the submandibular space and into the anterior neck and anterior superior mediastinum. And this patient with a history of Ludwig's angina, which is floor of mouth cellulitis uh, covered by Dr. Lobo. Uh, CT is important to fully characterize the full extent of any soft tissue abscesses that can be drained and realize that uh, the surgery can be uh, quite extensive and morbid. Moving on to patients with symptoms of dysphagia and odynophagia. Uh, odynophagia represents pain with swallowing and can be due to inflammatory or infectious processes typically, whereas dysphagia represents difficulty swallowing, which can be functional or structural. Functional causes include neurologic disorders, including stroke in the acute setting. Uh, Various structural causes in the neck uh, can mechanically result in dysphagia, and we'll focus more on those since this is a lecture on acute head and neck emergencies. Contrast-enhanced CT is, again, the first-line study of choice in the ER with fluoroscopic studies being complementary. So in this 28-year-old with odynophagia, we can see marked thickening of the uh, epiglottis seen on the scalp view, ref referred to as the thumbprint sign. Uh, the CT confirms marked thickening of the epiglottis in both the sagittal and axial planes. Note its relatively smooth appearance. Remember, the epiglottis should be wafer thin, just like one single Pringles potato chip. And if it looks like a stack, it's too thick. And if it's smooth, that typically represents edema, and the cause is uh, typically indicated in the clinical history.
Here's a companion case, again, of a patient with hot potato voice, marked thickening of the epiglottis on the scalp and on the axial images. But there's also marked thickening of the area epiglottic folds, indicating this represents supraglottitis. Here we see this patient image several months later, and you can see the normal appearance of the supraglottis following resolution. So there's been a demographic shift. We used to see epiglottitis frequently in children related to H. flu, but that's less common following vaccination. Now we see uh, supraglottitis uh, more commonly in young adults, uh, non-H. flu related, but with a lower risk of airway compromise as we saw in our second case. In this 20-year-old with left throat pain, we can see marked enlargement of the left palatine tonsil without a discrete fluid collection representing palatine tonsillitis. If this is not treated, it can progress and separate, and you can get a frank peritonsillar abscess, as we see here with a mature rim-enhancing fluid collection along the upper pole. Uh, and these are typically interposed between the pharyngeal constrictor muscle and the capsule of the tonsil. Uh, here's another companion case of a left peritonsillar abscess, but in this case, the abscess has ruptured uh, into the adjacent parapharyngeal space and extended uh, caudally uh, to the level of the thyroid cartilage. And once it's extended to adjacent neck, uh, soft tissue planes like this would uh, require an anterior neck approach to drain these more caudal fluid collections. And this patient uh, who presented with uh, oropharyngeal pain and had symptoms of oropharyngeal infection. We can see features of left tonsillitis, uh, but also note that there is thrombosis of the ipsilateral left internal jugular vein in this patient who was acutely ill and required uh, airway intubation or required intubation for sepsis. Uh, in the neck, we can see there's thrombosis of uh, the facial veins and ipsilateral intracranially cavernous sinus thrombosis was seen as well. On the uh, chest CT images, you can see areas of uh, peripheral pulmonary infarction with large pleural effusions, and this is a case of Lamier syndrome, uh, which represents uh, septic thrombophlebitis of the internal jugular vein associated with oropharyngeal infection, leading to septic pulmonary emboli and disseminated abscesses. This patient eventually recovered. This is here to just demonstrate the normal appearance of retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which can be prominent in young patients. Similarly, the adenoid tissue can be relatively prominent in young patients. Uh, when you have uh, pharyngitis, uh, this can drain to retropharyngeal lymph nodes. So in this patient who had left-sided throat pain, uh, you can see some thickening of the uh, pharyngeal mucosa and the left fossa of Rosemuller draining to this retropharyngeal lymph node that shows central low attenuation consistent with separative lymphadenitis. Note that the lymph node capsule is intact. This is important to recognize as separative lymphadenitis and not a retropharyngeal abscess because it can be treated non-operatively with aggressive antibiotic therapy. If this goes on to not be treated and ruptures, then you get frank retropharyngeal abscess formation, as we see in this case, which can result in mass effect on the airway, and this would require surgical drainage. Uh, remember on imaging that we cannot distinguish the retropharyngeal space from the danger space, and that the danger space uh, communicates with the uh, upper thorax. Uh, as a result, when we see fluid collections appearing in the retropharyngeal space, it's important to interrogate the upper chest to make sure we do not see extension. So here's an example of a fluid collection that is, uh, appears to be in the retropharyngeal space with peripheral enhancement in this patient with a history of head and neck cancer uh, who came in acutely ill. But here when we look in the superior mediastinum, we can see that the fluid collection extends into the posterior superior mediastinum and includes a uh, involvement of abscess in the danger space. And this 42-year-old with odynophagia, neck pain, and stiffness, note this large retropharyngeal fluid collection. But when we look in the axial images, we see a lack of peripheral rim enhancement, as we saw in the prior examples of retropharyngeal abscess. It's important to recognize this lack of enhancement. When we look at the C12 level, we see amorphous calcification adjacent to the anterior C1 arch. So classic case of uh, 
calcific tendonitis of the longus coli capitis complex due to hydroxyapatite deposition. And these fluid collections are typically non-enhancing but will be incredibly uh, painful. Important to distinguish this from a retropharyngeal abscess because it is self-limited, responds to non-steroidals, and is non-surgical. Moving on uh, briefly to discuss uh, food impaction. Uh, here we had a patient who uh, choked while eating. We can see an air fluid level. Here we can see the air fluid level just above the food, which appears as soft tissue attenuation intermixed with gas. And this is an impacted piece of steak. These always impact near the esophageal verge, near the thoracic inlet. Here we have uh, two different foreign bodies that were aspirated. Uh, the upper one representing a chicken bone and the second one representing a sewing needle and a tailor who aspirated it. So again, remember CT is helpful. These oftentimes uh, are lodged at the esophageal verge. Um, they can be difficult to see endos endoscopically, so CT helps. If you do an esophagram, it should be water soluble. And lastly, remember sometimes patients presenting with odynophagia are presenting with head and neck cancer, which can sometimes be advanced as it occurs in at-risk populations. So here we have a large uh, posterior oropharyngeal wall and hypopharyngeal wall tumor with areas of uh, extrapharyngeal extension and necrotic uh, lymphadenopathy that can contribute to dysphagia. This brings us to our last topic, which is the post-treatment neck, which can be difficult to uh, evaluate because of the extent of post-treatment changes. And these patients can be at risk for unique uh, complications, including infection and carotid blowout. So here we have uh, one patient with a history of a flap reconstruction as well as radiation for head and neck cancer. And we can see a small ulcer along the posterior pharyngeal wall. And on the CT, we can see again that this ulcer uh, extends into the uh, retropharyngeal and prevertebral space. We can see that there's marked destructive changes about the C3-4 and C4-5 disc spaces consistent with discitis, osteomyelitis with epidural phlegma and compressing the cervical cord. And those features, uh, again, the esophagram is complementary, showing the posterior oropharyngeal wall east, uh, ulcer. And here you can see the small fistulous tract extending to the prevertebral space and to the cervical disc spaces. And the MRI nicely characterizes the epidural abscess associated uh, with the discitis osteomyelitis compressing the cervical cord. Here is a companion case of a patient again with head and neck cancer, destructive changes at the C23 disc space. The ulcer along the posterior pharyngeal wall is subtle. And on the MRI, you can see marrow signal changes at C23 indicating discitis. And then you can see nicely the fistulous tract extending from the ulcer along the posterior pharyngeal wall to the C23 disc space. And this is our last case of a patient uh, with a history of a left fascial tonsil cancer treated non-operatively that developed an ulcer along the left lateral pharyngeal wall and came in with hemoptysis. And here we can see a frank pseudoaneurysm of the left external carotid artery confirmed at angiography with active extravasation uh, that was treated uh, interventionally. And so that brings us to the end. Uh, in conclusion, uh, many patients presenting with acute head and neck emergencies are presenting with uh, infectious or inflammatory processes, and CT is the first study of choice to help characterize fluid collections, vascular complications, uh, bony erosive uh, changes, and intracranial complications. And remember that sometimes the uh, signs of uh, acute inflammation in the neck can be subtle and may just simply be subtle stranding or thickening of the soft tissue planes. So remember to train your eye to look for subtle soft tissue infiltration, both in the facial soft tissues and within the masticator space, retrobulbar soft tissues and superior orbital fissure. And that brings us to the end. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. And if you are ever in Arizona, please look me up.